for joining us tonight. We're going to be talking about the Yomi, the uh, new kid on the block in implant dentistry. Uh, I was surprised to find out it's actually been around for five or six years, but it looked new to me a year and a half ago when I first got introduced to it. But I quickly fell in love with it and felt like it was something that I needed for my patient's benefit. So tonight we're going to go through why I love using the Yomi with every case. By the way, I'm Dr. Jeremy Thompson. I've been a general dentist for the last 25 years. I practice in Saratoga Springs, Utah, which if you don't know where that is, it's kind of along the Wasatch Front, kind of midway between Utah County and Salt Lake County. So the main population centers in Utah are kind of, kind of right in the middle of that. But um, the way this is going to work tonight is we're going to have about a 45-minute presentation followed by question and answers. So if you have any questions, click on the Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen and type in your questions. And submit that, and we'll handle those questions at the end so we can stay on time with this. So we're going to go ahead and start going through this uh, presentation. So um, here we go. And I not seem to be able to move. There we go. Now it's working. So this is me with a picture of my practice at New Smile. We are an implant focused general dentistry practice, general general dentistry dentistry practice. Um, we placed uh, now about a thousand implants with the Yomi, and uh, I've had the Yomi for about a year and a half, and just loving life with Yomi. So this is a disclaimer and indications for use that goes along with uh, this presentation. And we're just going to talk a little bit about the growth of the implant market. This is a really good time to get into implant, implant dentistry because more and more people are uh, starting to ask for implants. This is a graph just showing the growth of the amount of implants that are being placed in America. And it's estimated that a fourth of all Americans within a couple of years will have, will have dental implants. And I'm sure that of those of you who, who are practicing dentists, you'll see, you've seen that. You see that a lot of your patients coming in already have implants. Um, but uh, it's a good time to get into the market. There's a 3000 dentists currently in the United States performing full arch, which that doesn't seem like very much to me. Um, and full arch dentistry isn't necessarily for the faint of heart because there's a lot of things you got to do right, but it's a great time to get in. And when I went to Chicago, the full arch classes were packed standing room only, and a lot of the other classes weren't. So a lot of our analog dentistry just is going away. We're getting into some of these full arch reconstruction cases and a lot of digital stuff and printing and milling in-house labs. That's kind of the trend, the way things are going. But more people than ever are looking for implant treatments today than, than we have in the past. And, and the awareness of implants out there uh, for Americans is, is high. And so there's only one country in the world that I'm aware of where there's a higher number of implants per capita, and that's Korea, which if you went to the Chicago or any other of the conventions, you're going to see a lot of Korean products on the market because they're, they're kind of leading the pack along with the United States on on technology when it comes to dentistry. So this demand is gonna to continue to grow and <clears throat> we face all these challenges with our surgeries. Our, to place implants effectively uh, are, are limited by these factors you see on the left. These are the challenges we face, that you and I face in placing implants, hitting anatomical structures, worrying about the nerves, um, possibly running into neighboring teeth, um, inconsistent accuracy. This is a big frustration for us when we're trying our best to place an implant just where we want it, only to find out after the cone beam is taken that we were a little bit off, a little too deep, a little too shallow, a little to the right or the left, or a little tilted uh, too close to something. So um, and then getting into there, you know, being able to see things. Now, I'm going to address surgical guides for a second. Surgical guides often cause uh, difficulty in being able to see what you're doing, and that's the biggest complaint. 
with surgical guides, they're great and they do help us. But I know a lot of my colleagues have moved away from surgical guides and actually gone back to freehand. Quite a few of them, especially full arts doctors. After I was one of those, I did I did uh, guided surgeries for two to three years consistently on every full arts case. And I felt guilty at first moving away from them because of the frustrations I had with them, which were that I couldn't see what I was doing. The guide was bulky. The drills had to be extra long, which was really hard to access. Um, I didn't know how much of that resistance that was coming from bone or coming from the guide sleeve that I was feeling uh, with the handpiece. And then not being able to see what I'm doing. Can't see what I'm doing until the guide comes off. And that's when you find out whether or not you were anywhere close to what you tended to be. So those are some of the limitations. But the intraoral access and visibility that came along with guided uh, was, I think, what caused a lot of people to move away from it. But then I found out that a lot of the other guys doing full arch had also, for the same reasons, moved away from guides. So now having the robot, I get all the benefits of the guides without the guide in the way. Uh, bone density, uh, challenging. Again, the Yomi helps a lot with that because we can measure the bone density and I'll, I'll go over that in a minute. Uh, parallelism, you can perfectly parallel the implants with the Yomi at a click of a button. Um, in, inability to reproduce the de depth and angulation of the osteotomy. Again, we kind of already talked about that, but as we, those are the things that slow us down and cause you know, the inefficiency. And so, um, Long surgery times, patient discomfort, and then the pain afterward. These are the kind of things that we don't like to see that, that are result from all these challenges that we face. And Yomi helps us solve a lot of those very, very perfectly. So we're gonna, when you have uh, these things under control, what I'm seeing and what I've experienced in my practice is that I'm able to uh, expand my treatment, meaning that I can treat a wider variety of patients. I'm not limited. I don't, I don't say no to very many cases because the Yomi gives me confidence to do uh, cases that would otherwise be very challenging. And the stress level of delivering that care goes way down. So you're able to present with confidence. Yes, I can do this case. Yes, it will turn out great. And you know that it will. Um, so efficiency has definitely uh, been improved. We want to keep, especially for sedations, that time needs to go as short as possible. And for me, placing full arch uh, on a dual arch case, we're about 30 to 45 minutes for placing all 12 or more implants. So uh, that's from the time that we pick up the robot handpiece to the time we torque the final implant. We've timed it several times and we're we're in anywhere between 30 and 45 minutes for that entire procedure. So it's very efficient. Um, so the experience, uh, I want to just talk about that for a second, because for me and my staff, the stress level goes way down. Um, Dr. Morales, a colleague of mine who places a lot of implants, he got his robot and he said, he goes, Doc, I just realized at the end of my day that I'm not tired. And I had to tell him that I have experienced the same thing. My, I'm not stressed out and tired by the end of the day because it, it really does take your stress level down when you're not trying and trying and trying and worrying about the getting everything just right because that's all being handled. So here's kind of been our journey as dentists watching technology come down the road. Our standard of care has been able to improve. We started out doing freehand and then now we, then we went to static guides. And um, those are kind of starting to phase out in some arenas in some ways. And because of the limitations of static guides, we came up with things like camera navigation, which was definitely an improvement, uh, comes with its own set of limitations. And now we have, you know, like with our cars, we're now driving themselves. And uh, this robotic guidance gives us basically like global positioning for the mouth. It's like our GPS system for the mouth. It tells us exactly where we are at any given moment in time and uh, lets us watch us place that implant perfectly and helps guide us in so there's no, no mistakes. So this is what the robot looks like. And the business end is on the right side there. The three balls that you see are the joints of the machine. They have the shoulder there connected to the base. And then the one at the top is the elbow. 
and then the one holding the handpiece is the wrist. So it's much like a human arm. And there it holds the handpiece. What the robot does is lock you into a trajectory once you're in the right place. Helps kind of help you fall into the right place. Uh, if you go the wrong direction away from the osteotomy, it will give you a slight amount of resistance. If you go the right direction toward the osteotomy, it will kind of fall that direction. So without even looking, you kind of find the right place. Um, once you get the location about right, it will beat and kind of lock you lo lo location. Then it will uh, have you tilt until you get the right accuracy. Once the tilt is right, it will beep again and lock you into the angulation. And then you have to recapitulate uh, the uh, location. So once the angulation is right, you'll have a slight movement to pinpoint the accuracy over the side of the osteotomy. And then it will beep a third time and then you're ready to go. And um, once you drill down and you hit depth, it won't let you go too deep. It will actually prevent you. And this thing's, this robot arm is strong. It doesn't, uh, you can literally try to push it and make it go too far and it won't. So it's very robust. The thing in, you see to the left um, of the base there, I'll just, this here is uh, the tracking arm. This little part right here hooks up to the mouth, it hooks up to the link. You'll see that in just a minute, how the link goes onto the teeth or onto the bone to hold this and gives a robot a rigid fixation point which then it always knows once that's registered with the software, it knows exactly where the patient is throughout the entire surgery, any given moment. If the patient moves, this robot arm literally will move with the patient. It's really cool tech. And then we have a big screen here for the doctor to watch the surgery as he, if he cares to as he goes. And then this over here is the control unit. Uh, typically the assistant will drive the robot the doctor will give is issue orders to uh, pause, go guided, you know, go to free free mode or whatever. And it, the as the drive person driving the robot will control it from over here, so it's into the correct mode as you go, and enter in the drill sizes and things like that to speed things up, so the doctor isn't taking time to type in the drill, what size he's using, and things like that. So this handles our planning, our our planning software, it does the surgery, and then also helps us plan out our restorations. So here's the planning software itself. This is a very intuitive software. We have a 3D reconstruction here, which we can manipulate in any direction. And then we have our three different views, sagittal, coronal, and uh, um, uh, the other one, <laughs> three different uh, slices so we can always see what we're doing at any given moment. Um, and then it has these little drop down menus and back and forward arrows. So it, you just kind of go down, you go down and check the boxes and then click the next arrow and it just moves you through the software. So it's really easy to, to use, very easy to, to figure out how to work. So when I was looking at the robot, I needed to know whether this was a, a good decision and I'll tell you why I bought it. And then we're going to go through some case examples in this. We're going to talk about the uh, primary benefits of the robot, which is our primary stability consistently every time, safety near our anatomical structures, and then how it takes really difficult implant placements, what we call, would call three-pointers, and it will turn them into slam dunks every time, make them simple and easy. And then we'll, at the end, we'll talk about how I've been marketing Yomi in my, my own practice, so when I was looking at the robot, my evaluation process went something like this. These are the concerns I had here. Uh, my number one concern was if the patients thought it was scary. I mean, you've all seen Wally -E and rogue robots, you know, things like that. We've seen Runaways, we've seen iRobot, all these other movies that in, in <laughs> almost without exception, they show the robot going rogue and doing something that it shouldn't and taking over where it, where it shouldn't. And so one of the things that has been created by this, these wonderful movies we watched is a fear that robots will go rogue on us. Um, so I think the, the answer to that is patient education. Once I saw it and got familiar with it myself, I wasn't afraid of it anymore. I think patients need to see it. They need to understand what it does and what it does not. 
it does not take over the surgery. I am still in control. It simply helps me. And I, what I, the way I tell the patient is what this robot does for me is I plan out the implants where I want them to go. What the robot helps me do is duplicate that result exactly in your mouth so that it's exactly where I wanted it to go, because that's the name of the game for implants. And it, and as a side note, it makes the implant go in really tight. And they love to hear that. The implant's going to go in the right place. It's going to be tight. That makes them feel safe. So that's what the robot's helping me do. Not that I couldn't accomplish that, but it's hard to do consistently, perfectly every time. We're not going to say that to the patient, but it really is. So it's just a, a reassurance to them. So that paper, patient perception was a concern to me. But what I found through experience is that simply by educating the patients about it, they get excited about it. It becomes a benefit. It's not something scary. It's something they're literally excited about seeing in action. Um, uh, for me and everyone else, I'm sure cost analysis is a big concern. Can we really afford the robot? This is probably the number one question I get by doctors who, who I talk to about the robot is what does it cost? And um, the monthly payment plus the osteotomy fee, there's an ongoing fee as you place the uh, implants. There's a different plans out there based on it will customize to your particular needs as a practice. But for me, when I looked at the monthly payment plus the osteotomy fees together, um, this was what it was coming out to somewhere between 50 and $500 per implant. And for me, it's about 50 because I do a lot of implants and um, it would drop further for people who do more implants than I do. And but if you do a few a month, then you probably be looking at about 500 uh, implant per implant. So you can either add the robotic fee as a as a code and bill that out as a, as a separate code. Or you can simply just raise your implant fee by uh, that same amount, whatever you figure it is in your particular situation. And that will cover what the cost of the robot is. So for me, it wasn't a, it wasn't really a once I understood this. That didn't stop me from buying it. It was has been one of the best things I have ever invested in, and I'm so glad I did it. I always wish I'd have bought it five years sooner. Uh, this is another thing that I was concerned about. Is it really hard to learn? Seems like a lot of tech. And is it going to be difficult? Uh, what I found is it was extremely easy. The, the training support was amazing. They came in and spent the time to make sure we understood exactly what we were doing. And they literally came and attended every single case we did for weeks. And they offered to come ongoing whenever we needed a tech to be there and walk us through. They would they would uh, simply fly out and help us with the case. And that's still the thing. If I call and ask for someone to come, they'll come and help me. Now, I within a month of having the robot, I didn't need help. Uh, me and my team were extremely competent in doing it. Um, this was another concern for me. Is it going to take me longer? The last thing I need is something to slow me down. What I've found is that it actually is faster. There are some initial steps in the setup of the robot that take time, which are done almost 100% by the assistant. Um, when it comes to the actual surgery, it's way quicker. But overall, time savings with all the slowdowns to get going and then the time you make up, it's still faster than doing the procedure without the robot. We I've timed dozens of procedures and found that it to be, it's about 25% quicker overall, all things considered by using the robot. And then another one, a big concern for me was, I don't have big rooms and can I fit it in my office? So I actually went to see another robot user in Utah, Dr. Brooks, and I, I looked at his room. His rooms were smaller than mine. <laughs> and so I uh, measured the base of this thing. The cart sits on a 20 inch by 22 inch footprint. That's how big the, the base of the cart is. So that just wheels around. And then the arms uh, take up about three feet of horizontal space with the screens. And these are all on uh, movable joints. So they can be manipulated any which direction for where the, where the person that's gonna drive it stands, uh, how you wanna view the screen from the, as an operator. Um, and of course the robot arm is, is mobile. So I haven't found this to be a real concern. However, if you do have like a big roll away cart that comes over the patient, a tray table that, that is on wheels, uh, during the robotic portion of the surgery, that would have to be wheeled to the foot of the chair so the robot can 
can come in and take that space during that portion of the surgery. So not really a, a doesn't really interrupt the flow of the surgery. So this is what I wanted to know. Is it, can we really find the perfect marriage of faster, better, cheaper? And I, you've probably heard this before. You can have something that's better and faster, but it's going to cost you a lot of money. Um, you might be able to get something faster and cheaper, but it's going to be, you know, a piece of junk probably. Um, and then you can have it be cheaper and better, but it's probably going to take longer. And what I've found is that literally we actually do have this uh, middle triangle being accomplished with Yomi, where it, you say it's not possible. And uh, Bob Borson says, I could su successfully argue that cheaper and better is so rare that it doesn't really exist. And yet um, we are actually having a perfect marriage of these three factors. So for me, it was there was no reason not to do the robot. It made sense to me economically. It made sense, sense to me um, scientifically. But the biggest thing for me was what I'm going to go over next. Um, was, yeah, was it faster? Yes. Uh, was it better? Yes. And that's what I'm mostly going to be talking about throughout this presentation is why it's better. That's what we're going to focus most of the time about. Now, is it cheaper? Well, it depends on how you look at it. I already went over kind of the economics of it, but when we take into consideration the precision that we're able to treat even the most demanding cases with predictable success, which greatly increases our patient selection, delivering care with a greater safety, with much higher primary stability, with less post-op pain, fewer, fewer failures, and less redos, and shorter time to finals, uh, That's those are some... Some, it's hard to measure what that's worth. And I can tell you for me, it's been, I didn't need all those things even to be a factor. Uh, just the factor that, just the fact that it was a greater primary stability alone was enough for me to buy. Just the fact that it was a, a safer way to place implants was enough for me to buy. But uh, when you add all these other things in, it really does become uh, kind of a no brainer, honestly. Here's a couple examples. These, this, these implants down here, were done within the first month of me having the robot on a patient. It took 12 minutes to place those four implants and um, kind of your textbook perfect all on four situation. And uh, this was just really cool to see and to know that I that I did that from the time I started drilling to the time I placed my last implant uh, was just 12 minutes. And then the one above here, sorry for the skewing of the image here a little on the CBCT, but there was another case where, you know, a few months down the road having a little more practice. And this is not pushing it, guys. I'm not I'm not going for time. I'm just telling you this is what it took when I was going at the normal flow. It's not like I was trying to set a record. But these uh, four implants here took eight minutes to get in. So here's what to me is the number one reason why the robot makes them makes sense. Having primary stability is everything to us implant dentists. It really is everything. If we don't have that, we have nothing. You can do everything else right. You have to do 200 things right to do a full arch implant case from start to finish and get a, get it perfect. And if you don't have this, you, you just, the 100, 100, other 199 don't even matter. You have to have primary stability. And what I what I love about the robot is you get literally just rock solid cases. Um, I can get this. I'm always torquing out before I get to depth. Always. The, the implant drill is, is stopping uh, two, three, four millimeters sometimes before depth and telling me I got to get out my wrench and finish the job. But that's, I almost never get it all the way down with the robotic arm. It gets it 80, 90% of the way down. And then I'm torqued out with the handpiece and I got to pull out my wrench. I love, that's a good problem to have. That's the problem we want to have that it's torquing out before depth. So the planning software makes it really easy because you just look for how much green is on your implant. If you're seeing a lot of red, for example, this is an extraction socket where we're engaging the uh, bone, the native bone above the socket for our stability. And I stuck it in here to kind of show you if we're in air, it's gonna turn red. If it's hanging out in space or if we're in a trabecular space where there's mostly, there's you're in bone marrow and you don't have a lot of trabeculation, you're going to see a lot of this red. And so you just look until you see quite a bit of green on your implant and you know you're in good bone. 
So I say go for green. Uh, longer is better, of course. We want to get uh, more bone surface area and ideally achieve this bicortical stabilization. That is really key for implant dentistry. You making sure that we have cortical bone. We always get it here, or almost always, unless we're doing bone reduction or we're in you know paper thin bone. But uh, typically, we don't necessarily go for the stabilization on the apex of the implant, and that's super important. And what I found was you know doing it freehand or with even with uh, static guides, bicortical stabilization was a bit of a hat trick. It was kind of hard to get. With a robot, we get it literally every single implant we place, we have bicortical stabilization. Um, so this is just how it goes. You, you uh, For the NeoDent system, which is the system I'm currently using, if I stop before depth, I know that I have a quarter turn per, my ratchet has four clicks per circle, and they're one in, the uh, threads are a millimeter tall. And so I know if I turn it, four quarter turns, it's gonna go down a millimeter. So I, I'll i back it up if it's a little too tight. I don't wanna break my driver. So I'll I'll keep working down until I, uh, if I stop two millimeters short, then I, I know I've got eight quarter turns to get to my depth. And so if you do have less than ideal torque, which you are gonna run into uh, hardly ever with the robot, but it does happen then of course you're going to either not load that implant or I'd more ideally, you know, go up a size. How are we doing so far? Everything okay? Stay, am I going too fast? Um, here's a case I'm going to show that was just one example. So a patient comes in, 77 year old female. Uh, she's from out of state. She's going to be heading back home needs same day treatment because she's leaving the next day. Uh, she'll come back for the restoration later, but she needed to, this was a number seven, so, or excuse me, number 10, right up front, cosmetic emergency. Uh, we discovered this x-ray uh, shows that the tooth was completely bombed out, had to be extracted, but we didn't have a lot of room, okay? So a three, five implant in here would just give us barely enough room if it's placed perfectly and and I would love to see this is quite uh, empty trabeculation in the middle so we kind of not only do we kind of have a uh, bone loss here but we have kind of this short space to accomplish this in so this could go a lot of ways uh, if we were trying to freehand it might be risky if we try to use a surgical guide that's going to slow us down for this out of town patient. If we had time to work with then great. But because I have the Yomi, I can just tell her, absolutely, we can accomplish this, no big deal. Let's have a seat and let's get this done for you. So I'm gonna run through how we did this for this patient. So this will give you a, a idea of how it looks. So here it is, it's all draped with our, our barricade so that it stays sterile. All the parts in the robot are, are very sensitive to dust and things like that. So we have, we have a new barricade we place on it every time we set it up the assistant does to prepare the robot. And you can see the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna attach that tracking arm to our little link. This is a link we've uh, installed on her existing teeth with impression material. And then it holds the little kinematic mount that will then hook up to our tracking arm. So we're gonna show you how that works. So this is hooking up the tracking arm. And you hear that little bling? That's telling me it's in the right spot. Okay. Now we're gonna grab our, our robot and we're going to go for our landmark. That's gonna confirm that everything is lining up the way we want before we place our drill or osteotomy. We're waiting to hear a little bling again. There it is. So we've achieved our landmark. That's just a confirmation. So here we go. There's that first beat. I've lined up over the hole. There's the second beat and the third beat, boom. Ready to go. So you see, I can I can literally let go of that handpiece and pick it up again. It's going to stay right where it's going. The assistant is calling out the depth to me. Hey, three. He's saying you're at four, you're at five, you're at six, you're at depth, you know. And the, the robot also beep when you get to depth. And then, you, of course, like I said before, you can't go too deep, so it's really nice. 
So now we've uh, we've got our osteot. We're going to go right to our final osteotomy size from our pilot drill to our 3.5 drill. Five, six, seven, eleven, eight. There's the depth. Done. So I'm going to switch that out. Put my driver on the handpiece. Then we're going to get our implant loaded. And then we go back to our orientation. Boom, boom, beep, 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 ready to go. He's calling out the depth. Seven. Seven. Eight. Nine. Ten. Eleven. Boom, depth. Okay, so the implant's in. And now we're going to remove the tracking arm. All that for 10 seconds. And we're done. <laughs> so here's the post op x ray. We got that nice bicortical stabilization, able to get engage that sinus floor, uh, have just the right amount of thickness on each side. We had just enough room to have a millimeter and a half on each side of this implant. Are we able to place that platform about a millimeter subcrestal, even with the bone loss? And then put by putting a longer abutment in, there's our temporary. So here's how that worked. We had this 45 newton centimeters primary stability. We placed our acrylic temporary out of occlusion. Our total time in the chair was about an hour. But for me, <clears throat> I was in there about 20 minutes. Um, most of that time was in the extraction and making the temporary. So um, the actual time you saw for placing the implant with the robot was about, I think about three minutes from start to finish. So here's here's the other thing about the safety. Uh, we have all these anatomical structures we're trying to work around. We've got the sinus, we've got the submandibular fossa, we've got the inferior alveolar nerve, we've got all these areas we've got to avoid, and especially the buccal plate, the sacred area that we don't want to invade because we don't want to melt down that plate and have thread exposure. Um, but here's a neat little technique. If you look at this x-ray here, this was placed in a patient that uh, didn't have enough bone, was told they didn't have enough bone for implants. But we found a way that by doing this, it, it works out beautifully. You can get great primary stability and then an on-lay graft on this portion. So that's just uh, showing this knife edge ridge technique. Rather than reducing this knife edge ridge down, uh, you can actually get that implant into really great primary stability, and then the implant becomes your best scaffolding for growing new bone. So we've been able to help a lot of patients that way. Um, your number one enemy is skiving. So if you get a post-op x-ray after doing Yomi and your implant isn't the, the spot you planned it, probably that's because you hit some cortical bone and the drill bent off of its path. It's probably not the robot's fault. And so I had a few of these early on that I was kind of confused by. And then I started correlating that I would be hearing that little rattling sound during when you're doing your first osteotomy. You know, normally when you're doing freehand, it just skips off the bone. You can't get it to stay on path. But the Yomi is holding you on your path. So it's a lot like a static guide in that way. As you're doing static guided, you go down, you, you hear that little rattle of the drill it's probably because you're skipping off the bone and heading off into no man's land. So if you hear that rattle, that's a really good audio, uh, auditory clue that you need to just hang out in that spot for a minute and wait for that rattle to go away. And, and the robot arm will just hold it there for you. And once you have, have that rattle goes away, you know you're not, it's not, that bone isn't pushing your drill off to one side. That rattle is hearing the flutes of the, of the drill uh, knocking against the cortical plate. So that rattle tap technique is what you do. Once you've, the rattle goes away, you tap a little further and you work away down. And so in this way, we can, we can get uh, nice tight implants in cortical bone without having it knock, uh, head off to the side somewhere we don't want it to be. So here's the reasons we, our implants fail. Don't they, the number one is lack of primary stability. That's where we get our early failures. 
But the second reason the implants fail is because of improper placement. And that's where we get our late failures a month out, two months out, two years out, three years out, because it was almost perfect, right? It was just maybe a little too shallow. So we got some thread exposure, which then eventually it melted down the cortical bone. Um, and these things cause our, our pain, our implantitis, thread exposure. And so uh, quoting Lynn Thompson, who's my father, he says, almost perfect only counts in horseshoes. So with the robot, we're able to get it. We don't have to worry about almost perfect. Uh, Yomi takes care of both of these issues for us, takes care of the primary reason for our early failures is a uh, lack of primary stability. Uh, so our rock solid provisionals and quicker time to finals are a benefit of having that ideal primary stability. And that gives us our short term success rates going through the roof. And then of course, because we're so precise in our placement, that we're gonna have fewer late failures. We're gonna see these benefits of robotic placement paying dividends for years to come by having happy patients with happy tissue that don't have uh, reasons we have to explain why that that's now bad. Well, why doc, you place that implant, why I'm having a problem with it. So it takes these difficult uh, ones where three pointers, if your bone width is less than eight millimeters, you darn better well have that just right in between them. If the de uh, depth is less than 10, now you've got a, an issue with uh, trying to find a shorter implant, softer bone. Uh, if you're close to the anatomical structures where you're working with extreme angles and things like that, not a big deal. And sometimes the, with the anatomy of the uh, ridge being pear-shaped instead of round, now we've got all these weird anatomies trying to work with and it might look good from the top, but then when you get in there, you, you realize you're in the submandibular fossa or something. So or a knife edge ridge, and we kind of covered that. So it takes all these difficult ones and kind of moves them all over into this category where even if you have less than this, you know, if you got more than eight millimeters of bone, great, you can afford to be off a little bit. If you got plenty of depth, you can afford to be off a little bit, maybe. Um, but when you, do, you can't afford to be off is when you need the robot. And most of the time we're trying to maximize the space anyway. We're trying to put the biggest implant we can in the bone we have. So there's, when do we have wiggle room? Well, really hardly ever, honestly. And you who've done very many implants know that's the case. So uh, it'll take any three pointer and turn it into a slam dunk. So here's just some examples of that bicortical stabilization where we engage uh, the, the tip of the implant into the bone where we want to get both sides of the implant real tight. <clears throat> Easily achieved with Yomi. So here's just a nice example of how we get the AP spread and showing the cross section of each implant. We're able to often get implants way back here where maybe we wouldn't attempt it because we think we're too close to the nerve, but that's usually because we're scared because it has to be just right. Well, with the robot, we can, we can get it just right each time. So I'm gonna show you this quick case here. We did uh, 12 implants in 35 minutes and here we're gonna watch the timing. You watch this timer on the side after uh, we just finished all of our primary osteotomies of the pilot drill in less than three minutes, now we're doing our final osteotomy. We go from the pilot drill right to the final size. And now we're placing our first implants and we're seven minutes in. And there we go, pulling out the wrench. There's our third implants at 10 minutes. The last implant on the top, we're 14 minutes in. Now we're gonna switch the kinematic mount, put it on the bottom, start drilling the lower. And there we are placing our implants. We're up to about 30 minutes. We got a couple implants to go. There we are at 34 minutes, we'll arch upper and lower 12 implants. And this will show you an example of the capability of the robot here. I'm just gonna uh, recorded this little video of a case we did last in November. This guy is this already case. restored. Did a consultation for a month ago and he was told by other dentists he didn't have enough bone for implants and I kind of told him, you know, it was a pretty severe case. And as I looked through this, I 
didn't know how we were going to accomplish this case. I thought maybe we can do this, but it's going to be tough. You can see on the maxilla particularly, just basically almost nothing anywhere to work with. But, um, and on the mandible you can see uh, very little to work with. So we thought we would go ahead and, and do this surgery. And I want to show you how it turned out. So here's the post-op post x-ray for David, and you can see one, two, three, four, five, six implants in the top, seven in the bottom, and let's go through the cross-sectional views of each of these. Stability, 45 newton centimeters. Every one of these implants were ideal. There's that first lower one coming Stability. up. There's the second one. There's the next one on the top. Sneaking that in there. Tight spots. Every one of these were just kind of a miracle. There's that one. That one. And this next one on the top, i got to angle a little bit for you. So you can see the tips are almost touching on these two implants. I'm okay with that. There's the next one on the lower. And you can see on the lower how we were able to get right up close to that uh, mental foramen without, without invading it. And then the upper, pretty ideal, right up parked in the sinus. There's that one, safe harbor from the nerve. There's that one again, safe harbor, just right. You can see it parked right up in there. Uh, rock solid case. I, I honestly, this one even surprised me, but good AP spread, 13 implants, uh, about a three hour surgery to get this start to finish, including the conversion and getting him in some full arch temporaries. This guy said, hey, forget about uh, my two front teeth for Christmas. I want all of them. I said, well, you're gonna, I'm not expecting you to be able to get home with teeth, but we were really happy to send this guy home with teeth. And he's uh, now two months out and getting ready for his finals and everything turned out beautiful. So really fun. Thank you, Yomi. You make me look like a hero. So one of the questions I get is, can you always use it? Is there circumstances where you just can't make it work? Well, I found that to be the case with surgical guides, but uh, the answer is a resounding yes. Never yet found an implant that I can't place with Yomi. Um, real quick, if you know, there's there's ways if you find that the angulations are off and you're fighting the robotic arm a little bit. Uh, with a little experience, you find that just simply by moving the patient's head a little bit, it does have a lateral access feature where you literally can lock into a pre-trajectory based on it uprighting as it goes in. It's really cool. Um, so even in really difficult patients with trismus, with very limited access, you can literally get implants all the way in the back. So really cool. Um, these are other techniques you can you can use that can all, you can always get the implants in. There's another I just describing this case you're seeing above. A uh, 64 year old female told by multiple doctors she did not have enough bone for her on her upper arch for any implants without extensive sinus grafting etc. Could not have molars in her lower arch. This case was completed in three and a half hours with Yomi. All 13 implants have. 45 plus newton centimeters of torque, and she left with full arch fixed temporaries. Um, just rock solid outcomes, time after time after time. There's the cross sectional views of that previous case. Look at the bicortical stabilization on every single one of these implants on the top. The only reason you don't see it on the bottom is we have the nerve in the way. So obviously, we're not going to invade the nerve. So how do we market it? Um, mostly by talking about it. I think word needs to get out there. Uh, I was not even aware it was there until I went to a trade show 
and I heard a guy lecturing about it and it really piqued my interest and I'm really glad I did. But I'm glad that I had that opportunity. And so just talking about it, talking about its benefits, uh, the more we get exposure to it, I think it's really going to catch on. There's a couple of hundred robot users in the world right now. And I think there needs to we need to have 10 times that. Um, and I think that everybody placing implants ideally ought to have one. But basically talking about it and the way you talk about it with your colleagues is you talk about primary stability and safety near anatomical structures and how cool it is. And you want to talk about the financing of it. But when you talk about it with patients, what you say to them is, you know, because we have the robot, this is what we this is why your post-op pain is so low. This is why we are able to get this result. This is why I didn't have to refer you for zygomatic implants and have you spend a lot more money and have more more recovery. This is why we got you into your finals in two months instead of three or four. This is why um, we have very little failures. Um, that says, you know, this is why I'm able to do your case. So this is, I think, just by telling him, uh, the you know, looking at the x-ray together, telling him what they just got and why it was better helps them understand it. So this is some of the things that we've done. We've done open houses let people come in and try it and see it. We got a big response to an open house we did uh, a couple weeks ago. We had uh, 17 people show up on a Saturday and and we did a bunch of free consults and got we sold some arches as a result of that. I think about six arches came out of that event. Um, your website obviously is your primary uh, marketing tool and you can Yomi has a lot of materials that you can use for your websites, for displays in your office, education materials. And then you can, if you have the robot, you can uh, let your colleagues know that you have it and they can probably start referring uh, implant case, the more difficult cases to you as if you're some kind of specialist because you, in a way you are, not officially, but you have something special when you have the robot. This Yomi assets page I'm gonna show you, these are all the resources available in here. Um, power packed, tons of really awesome and well done stuff here that once you have the robot, you can add all of this to your marketing. So this is what my, uh, this has helped my practice to grow with the robot. And I think this coming year, we're gonna see it grow even exponentially more. And uh, sometimes we don't really know what we don't know. And if you were to, this quote from Henry Ford, I love, if you had asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. So, but no matter what level you're on as a surgeon, Yomi will take your game to the next level. It will make you a better surgeon. Sometimes doctors say, oh, I'm buying the robot for my associate because I don't really need it. You know, I'm good at it. So I'm just gonna buy one for my associate. And I say, doc, once you use it, you will understand why you are going to be using it more than your associates because you really, you really don't want, once you place robot implants, you're never gonna to wanna to go back to doing it any other way. Okay, well, I think we left a little bit of time for questions. I think I'm about 10 minutes over time. I did a little more topping than I expected, but um, let's go ahead and handle any questions that we might have. Thank you for submitting your questions. Please continue to submit them through the Q&A chat box in the bottom of the window. I have a few questions for you here, Dr. Thompson. Okay. So how do patients typically respond when they see the robot? So they just are fascinated. I thought they'd be scared of it. So it because it looks big and scary, it does look big and scary, but it looks super cool at the same time. I think by just appealing to their, their techie side and say, check this thing out. Look, this is what it does. Tell them what it does and what it does not. It doesn't take over the surgery for me. I'm in control. All it does is, boom, helps me replicate my plan in the mouth perfectly every time and give me tight implants. That's really all it does. And they're like, oh, cool, you know, and then you can go into more detail. So the patient response has been overwhelmingly just like they love it. They think it's super cool. They love talking about the fact that they had a, a implant placed with a robot, you know, and they're, whoa, cool. You know, it's just a kind of a, a pretty awesome thing. It was not as I, I thought it would be not as well received as it has been. I haven't had any negative, any negative from uh, except one patient who said, no, that just looks too, that's too much. I'm claustrophobic. I can't have something in my face. I, I can't do it. And so he, he opted to, basically, I was forced to do a free hand implant on him. But that's been the only exception out of 
a thousand implants that where a patient declined having the robot. Right. Can you only use all types of implants? Yes, it can. It's just, you just type it, it, it can upload the uh, library for your particular implant system. So as you're doing the planning, it will place your implant in the space. And then uh, you measure the length of the driver and program that into the drive into the software at, in each implant you do. And so it's very tightly controlled to work with any implant system out there. What was the learning curve for you and your team? Um, so because the training and the support has been so good, it actually was very short. It's a lot shorter than, than I expected. Like I said, in less than a month, I, I didn't ask for help unless there was just other reasons, but not because I couldn't figure it out. Uh, my team was the same way. They were intimidated a little bit at first, but the training was so well done that they really didn't didn't need a lot of hand holding after that. It was just, I would say about a two week learning curve, two to three weeks, month tops, depending on how many times you're using. If you're using it every day, then like for us, it was under a month. Fantastic. So, Doc, is it used? only under general anesthesia. Tell us about your experiences. Okay, well, the case you just saw that where we went through the with the lady in the chair, that was, she was awake for that. She didn't have any sedation. So no, it it's used for all implants. Um, I just do a lot of sedation. So I love the fact that um, it works for everything. And no, you don't have to, you don't have to be sedated for it. What about precision when you're seeing multiple patients in a day? So we, we did, we've done studies on the before and afters of how precise is the robotic uh, guided surgeries. And it's with under a millimeter in every dimension consistently. Um, and I think a half a millimeter is kind of the average implant that's not perfect in all angulation, depth, everything. So under half a millimeter is pretty darn good. Um, I don't know that you could get any better than that because the bone itself is going to push that implant around a little bit as it goes in. But I mean, precise every time that using it after uh, time after time, that's what I love about it. It is precise every single time. The more you use it, the I mean, it's, it's, it's the same, just as precise on the first implant I placed as the one I, the thousandth implant I placed. How are you switching from one arch to the other without any CBCT with the array with fiducials? So we take the fiducials on both arches at the same time. And then we just tell the robot, okay, we're working on the upper arch and we put the handpiece so it's oriented for the maxilla. And then when we go to switch for the lower, we tell the robot, okay, we're working on the mandible now. And we have to, we have to remove the kinematic mount and place it at the tracking arm on the lower and then um, turn the handpiece so it's oriented to the mandible and that's it takes about three minutes. Well, probably not even three minutes. It takes maybe two minutes to switch from maxilla to mandible and proceed with the surgery. Got another one here. My biggest concern is paying for it as I don't do many implants. Do you have any current advice? For uh, the biggest concern was what? I don't do many implants. Do you have any advice? Oh, um, so is that a price point question? I'm guessing. Um, if we don't do a lot of implants, is it worth it? You know, that's probably a, simply a personal decision. I would say if you do even, you know, up le even less than 10 implants a month where you're doing maybe one or two a week, that would be enough to justify it. Um, you're going to, and you're going to start doing more. Trust me, if you, <laughs> you get the robot, whatever number you're doing now, you're going to be doing a lot more implants because you're going to be offering that to more and more of your patients and you're going to be excited about doing it. With the addition of the system, have you been able to increase your fees for the, for the procedures for your patients? Uh, and again, personal decision. I didn't change my fee structure when I got the robot. Um, I just kind of rolled it into the to everything. But I think that it might be advisable under most cases just to, I mean, we, uh, change in fees are not something your patients really know about. You just change your fees. Um, so... 
If you are worried about the cost, then I think just increasing the cost of your implant fee by, again, if you're doing a few a month, you may want to increase it by three to 500. If you're doing a couple of dozen implants in a month, then you probably only need to increase it by $100 to cover the cost of the payment and the osteotomy fees or thereabouts, you know, it kind of depends on volume. So, but yeah, I wouldn't let price be a, a stopping point if that's, that's probably the biggest thing that shies people away. They're like, oh, that sounds great, but how much does it cost? And then they, they hear and they're like, oh, never mind. They're like, well, you got to look at it this way, you know, <laughs> and then it starts making a lot of sense. So we have a question here. I've been pushing to getting a Yomi for my practice and think that maybe I should wait until next year. What made you adapt early and why should I disrupt my team now? Yeah, um, well, for me, when once I found out what it could do, I could see that it was going to fill a huge hole that I had. What I hated about implant dentistry was when it failed or when it went south or when it wasn't just right. And I, I was seeing those issues. So once I found out that the Yomi could solve those issues for me 100%, that's when I couldn't get my hands on it soon enough. So that was what was most important to me. And that was why I bought it. If all else aside, I needed it for my peace of mind to know that I was delivering the best possible care to my patients. So, um, yeah, you could put it off. Um, I don't know that there's any reason to. If, you, if it makes sense in all other arenas, I'd say, do it sooner than later. You'll be glad that you did. We have a question here. Um, asked, although the maxilla can be managed, how about the mandible stability? Uh, the mandible stability yeah. is usually the best anyway because of, you've usually got your D1, D2 bone across the arch. Um, but one of the things that I love about the Yomi is that even in softer bone, because we're getting a perfect osteotomy, the osteotomy is going to be so perfectly developed that you're not you're not fracturing all that trabeculation around the implant site. So when the implant goes in and taps itself down there, you're going to get the best possible amount of stability. So I find that even with those pterygoids, they just they torque out too, just like any other implant. Um, so, but yeah, the stability is great. I mean, your your primary stability typically comes from uh, in any good quality bone is going to be the top four to five millimeters of your implant anyway, as far as your force distribution. So that's, I don't ever use a cortical drill. And if you're finding that you're not having the primary stability you want, just throw the cortical drill out and skip that step. You'll probably do a lot better. I think that's all for questions, Doc. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for okay. joining this webinar. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. And you're welcome to contact me at any time. Um, you can look for my credentials um, on the invite, but I, I think you can. If not, you can email me, jeremyt88 at gmail.com. Uh, my cell phone, 801-455-5799. I'd love to hear from anybody that has further questions. Thank you, Dr. Thompson. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening.